students, I welcome you once again to today's lesson. In our previous lesson, we started discussing strategic training process and what the steps are. I mean, we, we mentioned that there are nine major steps that we would want to look at, and we looked at the first four. In today's lesson, we want to continue from where we stop. We are going to look at the fifth um, step in the strategic training process. So I'll share my screen with you and uh, we can go through together. Good. So in the, in the strategic training process, the first step is selecting trainees. Now the trainees are um, one of the um stakeholders that are very, very important. I mean, it's crucial to choose the right trainees for the training program in the sense that it's not everybody in the organization who needs the training that you're offering at the time. Okay, some employees are good at one area and then weak in the other. So you need to identify what their needs are. It shouldn't be discriminatory. It shouldn't be in a, in a way that those who need it will not get it while those who don't. You know how in, in Ghana, some or, or in, in, in our part of the world, you realize that some people just select um, the trainees based on the fact that, oh, that one is my friend. He is not my friend. And at some point, we even see trainings as punishments. If you are selected to go for a training, I mean, it means that um, you are under punishment or something. It's not that way. Training um, should be based on needs. So once you're selecting the trainees, you should identify the needs they have and select them based on the needs that they have, all right? It shouldn't be discriminatory based on sex, religion, or any of those things that we can think about, all right? You should ensure that the trainees are able to understand the materials that are going to use. This will help you to, so if you're going to give training on, say, how to use computers, and a particular trainee has never seen even a phone before, it will be difficult. And other trainees are experts in IT. So you don't mix the two groups, okay? You ensure that those who have never seen phones are separated from those who have seen phones and even laptops before. And they're on and on. So a trainee with 10 years of experience in at, um, uh, say administrative work should not be put in the same training group with somebody who has just completed school and is now going to start learning administrative work. You should ensure that based on experience, based on the knowledge, the know-how, you should decipher and be able to put these trainees into different groups. So select the, the right or the appropriate trainees for its training program. And that is one of the ways by which the training program can succeed, okay? Others are weaker than others in several areas. So look at these things and then group them accordingly, all right? You don't put somebody who has been um, typing for the past 20 years and has a speed of say 100 words per, per second or per minute. Per minute is okay. Per second is, is true. I mean, it means that I'm exaggerating. So, 100 words per minute in the same group with somebody who is going to learn how to type 10 words per minute. It's a waste of time for the person who is going to do that. I mean, who does 100 words per minute? And again, the one going to do the 10 words per minute will also feel less confident to, to be able to put his, his skill to play. Because, I mean, once the, the one doing the 100 does his 100 and he is there now looking for A, looking for K, looking for Y, then automatically his vim dies out, literally. So we need to be able to train, I mean, select trainees properly in such a way that they fit perfectly into the group for which, I mean, into which the group into which you are, you're putting them, all right? And that makes it, I mean, makes it successful. You don't put people who are learning how to build in the same room with people who are learning how to sew in the same training group. It becomes difficult, okay? You put, you separate them, and let everybody do. So selection of trainees is extremely important, all right? So the next um, step, which is a sixth of the nine, is select methods of training. 
Now there are several methods of training. We have the on the job ones and then the off the job techniques. Now the method is extremely important, all right? If the method is not right, the tendency to fail is really high based on several circumstances, based on the way you want the training, based on how things are going, you're able to choose a method, all right? So whether on the job or off the job, it all depends on the circumstances, not your emotions or how you feel for that, I mean, that day, or how you think you're training. It, it depends on the circumstance. What training are you giving? What is your focus? What is your objective? That should inform which of, um, of the techniques that you're going to use or the methods. Good, so the on-the-job training methods, there are quite a number. We'll go through these few. Mentoring, which has to do with, I mean, learning from somebody who is higher in terms of any anything. So you, you pick a mentor. The mentor can be somebody who is close or far. You can learn gradually from the person without the person even knowing. Sometimes the, the mentor is aware of the mentee, okay? But the bottom line is you are watching the person, sometimes from a distance, sometimes from there, how the person goes about his things, and then you also do the same. Job rotation has to do with moving employees from one department to the other with the aim of helping them to learn, okay? New ways of doing things, new skills, how the new the other organization the other department would be so in ATU for example it's typical of one administrative assistant to move from finance to HR to um other liaison other 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 departments okay and that is job rotation with the aim of helping them to be able to pick the skills from the various departments job instructional training I mean going through a training with say a video or sort of, so you can go to YouTube and how to bake, then you start um, fetch one of that, fetch one one cup of this, fetch this and that. And sometimes <laughs> it's so dangerous. I mean, sometimes you follow through a video to cook and before you know, the food is actually fooding. <laughs> so you need to be careful with some of these videos. You know, anybody at all can create an instructional training and say that, okay, how to do that and, and just that. For you know, the person doesn't even know how to really, really do it. So you need to find the right sources. You need to find the right people who are given that particular training. I mean, they should be trusted. Don't just go to any block and start how to cook and you start preparing girls before you know <laughs> you prepared something else. So um the next one is understanding. All right. Um employees can be placed under top employees or people above them to, to learn from them. Okay, that's understanding. It's a deliberate action. You put the employee there deliberately for the, the one at the top. I mean, as he's going about his duties, this one is observing just so that in in an in the absence, what we call the succession planning, in the absence of the, the top manager, I mean, this other one who has been understanding him can take over. Now you have apprenticeship. Apprenticeship is usually for a period of time. So um, three years, four years, I mean, you go and study, work with a master, watch what he's doing, do the same, practice it here and there. I mean, it's only in our part of the world that you go to do apprenticeship and for two years, all you do is fetch water for the mother, go to her house, clean, wash. I mean, <laughs> you, you went there to learn how to sew, you went to learn how to fix automobiles. Before you know, you're just fetching water, okay? It shouldn't be. Apprenticeship should be well organized in such a way that every morning when the person, the apprentice comes, there's a roadmap. This is what we are doing. In the next three years, you should be able to do this and that and that. Then you sign a contract on that, and based on that, you're able to teach the person to know so that by the time the, the apprentice is leaving, you should be able to do everything that the master does. But some of us have, I mean, different thoughts on, on some of these things. So you think that, um, if you're able to teach your apprentice very well, your customers will move to the apprentice. So you just decide to mafia and it's not the best. So we should try our best to, at every point in time, as apprentices and um, people who are taking others through apprenticeship, the trainer should be able to deliberately teach the apprentice for him to become good as you are. Now, coaching is when an expert in a field is leading you, guiding you, helping you to go through a particular line of action. Good. So we go to off the job training. 
And one of the first ones we want to talk about is simulation. Simulation and vestibule training are, I mean, the same in terms of the fact that with training people with equipment and, I mean, if you're training people who deal with large equipment and, I mean, dangerous equipment, you want to use simulation or vestibule training, okay? You want to take them off the, the main workstation and use certain uh, miniature equipment to show them. It's just like teaching somebody how to shoot a gun. For the very first day, you wouldn't want to take the person to a real um, spot where you give the person a gun, a real, 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 I mean, pistol. You, you, you use simulates, okay? You try to use certain miniature um, equipment, okay? Like in, in Ghana, we say toy gun. You use those things. If you are teaching somebody to fly a plane, um, as a pilot, you don't just first day you take the person to Botuka, you, you put the person into um British Airways, Ghana Airways, what have you. Is, is Ghana Airways still? So <laughs> you put the person into any kind of um, airline, African world, and off you fly. Before you know, you are in the belly of a shark. All right, because the person doesn't have an idea. So you use simulates, miniature aeroplane, then you move gradually before you bring the person to the field. So you do the off the job first. So that's also vestibule training. So the two are, are similar. Then you come to case studies using business cases. Okay, So uh, you can say Apple, you learn from Apple's case. Apple did that and that and that. So for example, there was an issue with um, Samsung batteries. How Samsung um, handled that issue when their batteries were blowing out and killing, I mean, um, hurting people and all of that. Nobody actually died, but I think a lot of people had their faces blasted and all that. So how Samsung handled it, they recalled all the phones back. Typically in a part of the world, if you buy something and they damage you, you just send it to the bin. Nobody cares. But Samsung handled the case so well that organizations that are serious minded have started learning from them that if a customer buys something and it goes wrong, the best thing to do is actually to recall and replace. Okay. It makes the customer get more confident next time in dealing with you. So case studies help us to learn. Okay. You don't have to go through the experience to learn. It's only it makes it means that you are just unwise. Somebody has gone through this experience. You you have to learn from it rather than waiting to also go through that same experience. That's why even in advising others, people will call you and tell you that oh, I did this and this and this. This is what happened. So you learn from the case. Okay. So case study is also a form of um training. And then you have role play. <clears throat> in role play, um people in I mean the employees are made to um act as though they are in a particular role all right so if it's accounting and there's the accounting officers account officers they are made to play the role of an accountant how are they going to go about it so all these things will help them to be able to learn whilst um, preparing themselves for the job all right so it's off the job training now have management games certain games are played um, they, we have a game called Two Truths and a Lie. Two Truths, One Lie. That's a, a management game. There are several management games that can be played to depict how decisions should be taken in the organization. You, you realize that um, you see organizations bringing in somebody to change the organization, and then he says, line up, hold this person's hand, drag this person there, do that, do that. All these things are games that are played to show the employees the power of teamwork, the power of collaboration, the power of communication, because there's a game you play where you have to hide something and communicate it to the other um, um, team member so that the opponents will not see where you hit the thing. All these games are played to show us how to organize ourselves in our firm, all right? Then we have lectures. Lectures are typically um, given to a, a lot of people, a huge number of people, and then where you have the lecturer just giving out the information to them and whoever will assimilate what does that. And some people sit in a lecture and don't hear a thing. Others also hear everything. So, I mean, all these uh, methods or techniques under the various methods have their pros and cons. 
and I would want you to take this assignment. Look at the of the job um, training method techniques, on the job training techniques, and I we want to analyze each of them. Let's know what the um, advantages are, what the um, disadvantages are. I believe that it will go a long way to help us to be able to understand. Good. So we move to the seventh um, step. And the seventh step talks about choose means of evaluation of training. Now, evaluation is extremely important. You've done so well at this point, um, getting to the seventh point um, step. To be able to evaluate your, your training, you need to choose a means. Okay, you've not, you've not started evaluating yet, but you need to choose what means you are using to evaluate. So formative, the formative has to do with Evaluating a training program during its development stage. So as you are developing, you are evaluating, okay, in order to make modifications. So from time to time, you make corrections in the, the training that you are um, trying to develop, okay, so that you, you are able to correct things early before they get out of hand. So you are, you are trying to make the thing better. So as you are, you are developing, you are modifying. Good. And then the summative has to do with after the training, Okay, program has been designed. You you conduct the summative training um, evaluation, okay, to be able to provide uh, information on its effectiveness. Then the process, process evaluation focuses on implementation. So the point where you are doing, you are embarking on the training, that is the implementation stage. So you are, you are looking at how the training is going to determine the strategies and activities, if they were implemented or not, okay, how, what did you intend to do? Have they been achieved? That's the process evaluation, the implementation process. At that level, you do the process evaluation to check how it was implemented, what you plan to do, were you able to do it? And then the outcomes um, evaluation focuses on changes in knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. So these people were coming in with a particular mindset, with a particular behavior, with a particular attitude. After the training, what is the change that has come? That is the outcome evaluation, okay? You, you try to check what differences have come prior to the training, okay? Then impact evaluation has to do with the long-term sustained changes, okay, on the job performance as a result of delivery. So you've done whatever you have to do. It has changed their behavior. But in the long term, what is the effect on the job? If their behavior has changed, it should reflect in the sales. It should reflect in the production. It should reflect in performance. Everything that they are doing, it should reflect in it. So that is what we have for choosing the method of evaluation. I would want to end here, and I would um, like you to put in your questions at the chat console. I'll gladly answer every one of your questions. In our next lesson, we'll look at the eighth and the very last um, one, which is the ninth step in the strategic training process. Thank you for sticking with me. Bye.